answer questions like those, we have to figure out one, what stimulus causes these behaviors, and two, what functions the behaviors serve. To do this, I'm going to need the help of one of the first animal behavior scientists ever, or ethologists, Nico Tenbergen. Tenbergen developed a set of four questions aimed at understanding animal behavior. The questions focus on how a behavior occurs and why natural selection has favored this particular behavior. Determining how a behavior occurs actually involves two questions. One, what stimulus causes it, and two, what does the animal's body do in response to that stimulus. These are the causes that are closest to the specific behavior that we're looking at, so they're called the proximate causes. In the case of the male Siberian hamster, the stimulus is a delicious smelling pheromone that the sexy female hamster releases when she's ready to mate. The male hamster's response, of course, is to scuttle surprisingly quickly over several miles if necessary to find and mate with her. So, the proximate cause of this behavior was that the girl hamster signaled that she was ready to knock boots and the male ran like crazy to get to the boot knocking. Asking the more complex question of why natural selection has favored this behavior requires asking two more questions. One, what about this behavior helps the animal survive and or reproduce? And two, what is the evolutionary history of this behavior? These, as you can tell, are bigger picture questions and they show us the ultimate causes of the behavior. The answer to the first question, of course, is that the ability of a male hamster to detect and respond to the pheromones of an ovulating female is directly linked to his reproductive success. As for the second question, you can also see that male hamsters with superior pheromone detectors will be able to find females more successfully than other male hamsters, and thereby produce more offspring. So, natural selection has honed this particular physical ability and behavior over generations of hamsters. So, uh, who would have thought to ask these questions in the first place? And where's my chair? Nico Tenbergen was one-third of a trifecta of revolutionary ethologists in the 20th century. Along with Austrians Karl von Frisch and Konrad Lorenz, he provided a foundation for studying animal behavior and applied these ideas to the study of specific behaviors, and for that, all three shared the Nobel Prize in 1973. You may have seen the famous photos of young gray lag geese following obediently in line behind a man. That was Lorenz and his experiments, first conducted in the 1930s, introduced the world to imprinting, the formation of social bonds in infant animals, and the behavior that includes both learned and innate components. When he observed newly hatched ducklings and geese, he discovered that waterfowl in particular had no innate recognition of their mothers. In the case of gray lag geese, he found the imprinting stimulus to be any nearby object moving away from the young. So, when incubator hatch goslings spent their first hours with Lorentz, not only did they follow him, but but they showed no recognition of their real mother or other adult in their species. Unfortunately, Lorenz was also a member of the Nazi party from 1938 to 1943, and in response to some of his studies on degenerative features that arose in hybrid geese, Lorenz warned that it took only a small amount of tainted blood to have an influence on a pure-blooded race. Unsurprisingly, Nazi party leaders were quick to draw some insane conclusions from Lorenz's behavioral studies in the cause of what they called race hygiene. Lorenz never denied his Nazi affiliation, but spent years trying to distance himself from the party and apologizing for getting caught up in that evil. Now how exactly does natural selection act on behavior out there in the world? That's where we turn to those two types of behavior that are the only things in the world that matter. Eating and sex having. <laughs> Okay, so for this next series of videos, I'm actually going to manipulate the stimulus on some orb weaving spiders. Um, you know those orb weaving spiders where you walk through, they've got webs everywhere, and you walk through them and just go yuck, yuck, yuck. Um, those webs are obviously very important for a whole range of things, and I want you to think about it. And I really want you to think about the different, the, the different stimuli that I'm actually going to produce 
um, and think about why, how their response might differ. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually just throw some little bit of leaves um, into their web. So here you go, These are, here's an orb weaving spider. I think this is a St John's Cross orb weaving spider. Let's see if we can find it right there. Beautiful, there it is. Um, so essentially what I'm going to do is actually throw a little bit of leaf that falls into their web. Let's look at their response. The next stimul stimulus that I'm going to apply is a much, much larger stimulus. So really rock the web um, and see how they respond to that and see what they do differently. So what I want you to think about is essentially these different stimuli, how they respond, um, how they might actually sense the, di the, different stimu uh, uh, the different stimuli, and think about the evolutionary significance of why they might act differently um, to uh, a leaf or something actually hitting the web compared to something large that might actually be be hitting the web. So that's it for you guys. I'm going to play the video and I want to see, um, want you to write down um, what you think that uh, the ultimate and proximate causes are for their behaviour. Be 